Hello everyone, welcome to the Data Hour series. I am Shishir Singh, along with Jaskirat Singh from the Data Analytics team of Analytics Vidya, are thrilled to be with you here this evening for a session full of action-packed learning. Our session today is about building smarter solution with no expertise in machine learning. Now, on to our presenter today. I am delighted to be joined by Lauren Pickers, who is currently Developer Relations Engineer at Google. Prior to joining Google, he worked on educational solutions, pioneered the ebook industry, and co founded Booking. Having over 25 years of work experience, his journey has been nothing but a dream for tech lovers. On behalf of Analytics Vidya and our attendees, I welcome Lauren for this session of Data R series. Lauren, the stage is all yours. Hello, everybody. Um, can you hear me? Just a yes, yes, Lauren. Perfect. Your voice is audible. Okay, perfect. Um, I cannot start my video, so you, oh yeah, I can now. So, hello everyone. I think you can also see me. Yeah. Uh, so thanks a lot for for having me today. I'm I'm currently speaking from uh, Paris, France, uh, and it's a pleasure to be with you and and especially with uh, many people from India, but also from uh, many other countries. So, so thanks a lot for, for having me today. We're gonna speak about machine learning, but uh, in a pretty special way because I'm not an expert in machine learning, but stay with me, stay with me. Uh, I'm pretty sure you will learn something from this talk, uh, whether you're an expert or, or, or not. Um, okay, but maybe uh, let's start with uh, a quick introduction. Um, so I'm Laurent, uh, I'm French as you can tell, Hello, everyone, uh, by my accent. I'm a developer advocate, so developer relations engineer uh, at Google, and I focus on, on cloud technologies. And before that, in a previous life, I spent 17 years uh, in the ebook industry. I was a pioneer. Uh, in 1999, we built one of the first three ebook devices in the world. And, and uh, through that, also, I co founded Booking on the way. So I guess there are many different types of uh, practitioners and developers among you. Uh, we are not uh, in a physical uh, uh, room, uh, unfortunately, so I cannot ask many questions, but there will be space for questions at, at the end. So if you, uh, um, oh, yeah, I, I love this quote from, uh, from Clark, um, any sufficiently advanced technology is indescribable from magic. Um, I've been watching applied machine learning for a few years now. And whenever I see something new developed with machine learning, it's strange, but it always feels like magic. But my goal today is to show you that, okay, it, it feels magical, but at the same time, this is just technology, right? And, and anyone around us and, and yourselves, we can do something smarter uh, thanks to machine learning, okay? And, and that's my goal to show you that. Today, with a, a large overview, so that there's a lot of content, uh, I will try to show you as many examples as possible, okay? So what's machine learning? Quickly, this is my own definition, a wrong one, but this is mine. Uh, this is the way I've been using machine learning for a, a few years. You have data. This is your input data. You want to understand your data, and you want actually to extract information out of your data, okay? This is how I've managed to build smarter uh, applications understand your data, extract information. Of course, this is not the real, the true definition of machine learning. Machine learning is a part of uh, AI. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, you can uh, also post uh, questions in the chat. If I can, I will try to answer them live. Otherwise, at the end, I will go through them, okay? So feel free to ask questions in, in the chat uh, live. Uh, so yeah, I was saying machine learning is a part of AI. And more specifically, inside machine learning, deep learning, dealing with neural networks is the technology that brought most of the, the innovations uh, for the past years, okay? So that's the true definition. So how, how does it work? So uh, searchers, there, there were a few waves of AI in the 50s, in the 80s, the 90s, um, and especially in the 80s, pe people thought, okay, let's try to mimic the way we think our brain works with synapses, with networks of neurons and so on. Um, and for that, we need many examples. And if you think about it, that's how we learn. Uh, as, as children, 
we learn from our parents, from our sisters and brothers, from our friends, from our teachers and so on. We learn a lot from examples. That's how machine learning and deep learning in particular, but I'll be using the term uh, machine learning. That's how it works. You need examples. And the magic is that you, thanks to that, you manage to solve problems. And uh, it's, a, it's solutions that didn't work before. I mean, if you tried to uh, solve these problems al with algorithms before, it kind of worked, but machine learning now manages to solve some kinds of problems. Okay, I I'll show you uh, which ones. Um, so let's take, let's take a step back and try to see the landscape. Uh, which ways, uh, with which ways can you benefit from mach machine learning today? So of course you can develop expertise um, and you need time. Uh, maybe you are uh, followed courses uh, of deep learning and then you're already an expert, you've developed expertise, maybe not in all uh, topics. Maybe you only know how to work on vision or, or how to work on data and so on. Um, mostly if you deal with deep learning, you will deal here with neural networks, okay? But the landscape is larger than that uh, now. Um, if you are a developer, you can use APIs. And these APIs um, are actually wrappers around big machine learning models that have been trained, sometimes on millions of examples. And, and they do provide you a way to uh, actually uh, use machine learning without any no knowledge, okay? And uh, in between, as you see, there is a big gap that's been filled for a couple of years now and we call it uh, at Google at least uh, AutoML, but it's a term that caught on. So I think other companies are using it as well. And with AutoML, you can build your own customized models still without any expertise. And the purpose of, of this talk is to show you these like Lego bricks, we call them the building blocks. You can actually take one of these Lego bricks and, and use, uh, use it uh, inside your own solution and make it smart, okay? So let's start with the, the machine learning APIs. I will be using uh, Google Cloud products as examples, but keep in mind that uh, most of uh, the principles are very generic. So you can use uh, APIs uh, from other cloud providers, from other uh, specialized companies. And sometimes, uh, for instance, in a browser, sometimes you have APIs, existing APIs, with machine learning uh, models embedded that you can use right away, okay? Um, so if you remember my definition, um, you have data uh, as input and the data can be text, images, videos, uh, or even speech. And from that, you extract information. And sometimes the information is actually your input in another way, okay? So I'm gonna show you uh, these different machine learning models uh, um, and especially um, ML APIs. So I love to start with the vision uh, model for purely personal reasons is because when I was a student, so in, in the 90s, so eh, eh, <laughs> some time ago, I was trying this problem to try to understand what was in a picture. And at the time with my teachers, the only way we had was to use, um, uh, to make edge detection, right? To detect edges in a picture with, for instance, uh, a Sobel filter. And from that, from the edges, maybe we could tell here that there are flowers, right? But it didn't work, actually. Uh, we could do some little stuff. And as soon as we would use new pictures, it just failed, uh, failed miserably, uh, unfortunately. OK, so machine learning here is, is a very nice solution. The first feature a vision model can do is to give you labels. So to describe you the picture with, label, with labels. So here, uh, this picture is about nature, flowers, gardens, spring, plants, botany. Everything is correct. Here, so it's a REST or gRPC, it's an API, a web API that you can call. And here on the right, you see the JSON response that you get. And for instance, for nature, I get a score of 95%. Most of the time with machine learning models, you get confidence scores to know how confident the model uh, is with the answer, okay? So that's very important. Uh, with a low score, sometimes it's better not to show it to the user or to be very careful with, with the result, okay? Uh, a vision model can also detect uh, landmarks and, and more specifically, it matches pictures 
uh, between them. And when pictures are very close, then maybe you can deduct something. You can deduct that this picture was taken, taken somewhere in the world. And that's what I tried here. So it's the same picture as before, but it's unique because I flipped it, I zoomed in the picture, cropped it, I applied a color filter so that picture doesn't exist, right? Uh, it exists in a different form. And here, the vision model is able to tell me that this picture most likely is about the, the Hobbiton movie set. So this is where the Lord of the Rings movie were shot. And it even gives me the GPS location. And that is perfect. It's exactly where the, the picture was taken. The confidence score is a bit low, 61%, but the, the response is perfect. Okay. Uh, actually, I did derive this, this picture pretty pretty much. Uh, it's there's not any single pi pixel in common with the original one. Okay, a vision model can also do more. It can detect objects with banding boxes. So here, this is the, the the cast of the Lord of the Rings movies in a restaurant, I think, and I get the banding boxes for the persons. You see here the big boxes here, even the small person here in the background. Um, uh, uh, even smaller parts are detectable, like pants, t-shirts here, even the ceiling lamp here is detected. And this is how you, you get everything. Uh, so, so it's like class mapping, right? A person is a, is a class and whenever someone uh, or pixels looking like a person are detected, they are mapped to the person class, okay? It can be even more precise. It can detect faces. So here it's a 3D rendition of Gollum. And uh, so it's not really, uh, it's not a real picture. Um, uh, it's a 3D rendition, uh, but uh, as you know, Gollum uh, was a human being and, and, and it does look uh, like a human. And the, the answer that I get uh, is the following. Uh, so I get a banding box for the, 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 the whole head. I get the close up banding box here. And I also get different dots for the nose, the mouse, and everything. So we'll we'll do a live demo all together uh, in the second part of, of the presentation. Um, a vision model can also try to detect emotions on on faces, right? And here, what I get is that most likely, or maybe not most likely, but likely, this face is angry, and this is Gollum. Uh, Gollum is always angry, right? Uh, and you get uh, more features. I, I'll let you have a look. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you at the beginning. Uh, I will. You can stay with me and focus on the slides. I will give you one link, one link at the end, a sing, single link, and you will have everything. Okay, all, all, all that is here, all the different pointers and, and uh, present uh, order articles and so on. Uh, you will have one single link at the end, okay? Um, and more than that, also another problem that is so, so, uh, fully solved, it's OCR, so text detection, optical character recognition. Uh, previously, companies uh, developed algorithms, right, to detect glyphs um, with some uh, different methods. It, it worked, but there were always mistakes. Here, it's uh, you get very, very few mistakes now, thanks to machine learning. So here, it's a screenshot, okay? And what I get with the vision model is uh, the different blocks of text here, the different sentences, the different lines, different words, and even the different symbols. So now it's a kind of boring. O OCR on printed text is a solved problem. It works really almost perfectly, um, but it's always interesting. Machine learning makes mistakes like, like humans do mistakes. So it's always interesting to see the limits of a machine learning model. And so here, uh, what I tried is I applied a, a perspective effect on the screenshot and it still works. It still works. Um, the text is perfect. Uh, it's making uh, maybe one mistake, very small mistake. The double quotes here at the end are transcribed as a single quote. So you see the level of, of, of accuracy that, that you get. Now the next level is handwriting detection. So it, it almost never worked or, or on a specific, like uh, uh, um, analyzing checks with very, very expensive solutions and that would only work in some countries because we have different handwritings and so on. So here, um, it's not as perfect as for printed text, but it does detect handwriting and does very few mistakes. So here, this is a sheet of paper written by Tolkien himself. 
And what I get is still the same. I get different blocks of text, different lines, different words, different symbols. Um, and the result is amazingly good. Um, the only annoying mistakes mistake it makes here is even, even things. I know the, the context. I know that they are elves, right, uh, in, in Tolkien. Uh, and here, even though I would read it in a, in a slower way, here I do read elven kings. So here it's making one annoying mistake, but that's it. The rest is very, very, it's all, it, all, almost perfect. Uh, even at the end, yeah, that's the only annoying mistakes, uh, mistake it makes. Okay, so, so remember OCR, now you can detect printed text and, and writing thanks to machine learning with very, very uh, few mistakes. And finally, um, you remember uh, vision models can detect uh, objects. And so they can also try to match these objects with existing ones. And this is what we call web entity detection. Uh, a web entity is someone or something famous. And most pro usually uh, the person or the, the, the entity has a Wikipedia page. If you have a Wikipedia page, you're famous, let's say it that way. So here I took a unique picture of Tolkien that I had never seen before. Uh, it's been used once in a Spanish newspaper. And once again, I modified this picture. I zoomed in, cropped the picture, applied a color filter. So it's a different picture, right? The, 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 the background is, is not the same. It's a close up. And the vision model tells me that most probably this picture is about GRR Tolkien. I was very, very much surprised because this is, this is perfect. So here it tells me that uh, the label attached, the best label you could attach to this picture is GRL Tolkien. And I even get the URL link to the picture that matches. It's a single picture that partially matches this one. It's actually where I got the, 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 the picture from, from this Spanish newspaper. You can tell it's, there is a Spanish context here, language called uh, Espanol, Spanish, um, and I was even more uh, surprised is that this is the web entity for Tolkien. So the description is GRL Tolkien, but better than that, I get a unique identifier here. So there's a big knowledge graph. So it's, it would be a token itself. Uh, you know, we've been crawling the web for over 20 years and to understand what we have um, on web pages, uh, we need to understand the different entities. And this is the entity for GRL Tolkien. If we were talking about Tolkien, Christopher Tolkien, the son, then I would get uh, maybe just Tolkien or Christopher Tolkien, but you cannot really trust text, right? It, it, there are different ways to write about entities sometimes. And so here I have a unique way to detect Tolkien, whatever the language, whatever, if he had pseudonyms or whatever, it, it doesn't, but if he had, uh, then I would use, uh, anyway, I use the entity ID to uniquely identify objects or entities, okay? And you can also uh, detect other uh, images that are similar, like a person walking in a forest or uh, a person against a tree, okay? And, and it's really amazing that it works so well. So <clears throat> you've seen a few examples. I told you it's an API, but there are client libraries. So I'm pretty sure you will find one of your favorite languages. And what I, what, what I love with uh, client libraries is that you can actually in a few lines call the machine learning model, call the API and get the result and use the results right away. And here, just take this, you create a client, always the same principle, you provide the content. So an image here, and you call the features that you, you want, face detection, for instance. And for one picture, it's the result is live. And, and then you can, for instance, detect all and, uh, and know where all the faces uh, in the pictures are. And also what is uh, what are the sentiments that have been detected. We'll do a demo with this code uh, a bit later, okay? Um, now, uh, this uh, almost the same, but with one more dimension, time. If you take pictures with time, then it's a video. Uh, so rather than speaking about the features, let me show you uh, in this demo. Um, so here it's a video that has been uh, transcribed by the video uh, intelligence API. So that's our own product, but 
it's a video model, right? That is able to understand the video. So what it can do, of course, is it can describe uh, a video with labels, but it can also detect the different video shots. So video shots is a segment that unique, uniquely identify, identifies a, a part of the video. And so you see here, there are many, many small segments of around two seconds. Um, you can do object tracking. So here it does detect a bridge, but if the, if, if the camera moves, you see, so here it's able to tell you the location of all the different objects. It's also able to detect the persons. So you see, you have the skeleton of the different persons. So it's even better than uh, with the vision API. It does also work on face detection, but what's great in the, with the video model is that you can track the different entities so remember, you have one more dimension time. So here you can know how many people you have and where they are moving inside the, the segment, inside the video shop. Uh, you can also recognize uh, logos. So let me stop the video and have a look what's been detected. Um, so there's here a YouTube logo towards the end. Okay, so it's small here. So I guess the resolution is higher than, than what you're showing, what you're seeing here. So it, it did detect the YouTube logo here. Um, it can uh, transcribe your the text. So you remember OCR, so it works still on printed uh, and, and handwriting. And here you have all the text that's been detected in the video and you can track it, of course. So here, Pennsylvania, I don't, okay. There were many, many different states written here. So, sorry. So it, you can detect the text uh, and track it. You can uh, know whether there are parts that you should maybe not show to children. Uh, that's what we call explicit content detection. And also, but something that you'll see a bit later in a different form with the, the Lego brick, with the building block, is you can actually extract the speech and get it transcribed into text. And here, this is all the text coming from the speech inside the video. Okay, so uh, and and, and it, it, there's, there, there's, there are many features like like this. Uh, I have a few uh, code labs, um, so I, I'll give you the link at, at the end. But uh, let me show you here. This is an example. Um, where's my ticker here? Okay, sorry. Um, so here it's an example of object detection inside uh, videos. Okay, uh, I'm just showing the, the bonding boxes and creating a, a GIF uh, uh, from it. Uh, here, this is the few lines you need to actually uh, analyze the video and understand it. Uh, and from the result, you can do uh, lots of stuff. You can uh, cut the video into different into the different segments. Um, I'll, sh I'll show you more examples uh, at the end. Okay, with just these few lines. For videos, of course, this is not in real time you, the, because the model needs to sample the video to extract the different frames. But if you have a video of five minutes, in a, in a couple of minutes, you, you get the answer okay, to give you an idea. So here in this example, this is doing object tracking. But as you've seen in the demo before, you can do uh, a lot more than that. Um, so we've seen what you can do with uh, visual data, pictures and videos, but you can actually work on of course, you can work on text uh, because uh, in reality, text is uh, what uh, researchers worked on uh, initially. Uh, on computers, we all deal with text. We code uh, programs with text. We write text. We exchange uh, messages in text and so on uh, from, from the beginning. So uh, it's a big field called NLP, Natural Language Processing. And of course, there are NL models. Uh, to understand text. So the first uh, feature an NL model can do is it can uh, give you the syntax of uh, a full article, uh, paragraphs, art, uh, uh, chapters, just sentences, uh, whichever the, the level you, you, you'd like. Here, what I get is that, okay, this sentence is in English. Okay, uh, was pretty obvious. Um, but here I do get uh, the full uh, syntax of the text. So maybe you don't see the, 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 the use but it's actually something pretty difficult. Uh, in, in the past, I've been using um, NL uh, engines, not models, engines or 
manual models and it never well, worked well and uh, it was always designed with uh, language people for one language and so on here it does work with many different languages it's very precise you see you, you can uh, you can go up to the level of the punctuation and you also get the lemmas so i love that it means i can have the canonical form of, of a verb or a noun so it means i it does simplify the, the way i can use the results okay maybe more useful to you and like in pictures before uh, it can do uh, entity that it can detect entities um remember entities are uh famous or uh persons or or uh, things here they are mapped to um class to different classes so let's have a look so here in red we have persons tolkien is a person a writer is a person and so on um and here are the different um precise results so tolkien is a person and i have some metadata together with it uh and here i was amazed when i tried that i actually have the same unique identifier here as before with the picture of tolkien so it means that i can work with identifiers in text in pictures and in videos pretty amazing uh british here is mapped to a location because it relates to the united kingdom that's good and the three books the Hobbit, the Lord of the Rings, and the Silmarillion, each of them is mapped to a work of art. And here I have the link to the Wiki, Wikipedia page. Uh, and there are different ways. If it, if it was a different language, I would get the same result. I mean, it would be uh, the Silmarillion on Wikipedia, maybe in a different language. Uh, so that's a, a very easy way to uh, detect entities. Companies are using that to detect the way we speak about uh, to detect when we speak about their companies, maybe just not. Uh, oh, you cannot see the presentation. Uh, is it this one? Okay, uh, I don't know. Can every, everybody see the presentation? Oh, okay. So it's my fault. Is it better now? Oh, okay. So I have the focus on my shared video. Is it better? No, okay. So let me try to, um, to uh, stop the sharing and share my screen again, okay? Sorry about it. So the sharing is stopped. Is it better now? Okay, okay. <laughs> so I hope it will not switch back. So, um, so you remember we can detect entities and we can also classify content. So on the same piece of text here, what I get is that it should be classified under books and literature at 97% of uh, confidence. That's perfect. This kind of feature is used by companies who have archives, newspapers, for instance. Uh, they have scanned uh, their old newspapers. They have made an OCR uh, pass. So they have the text. And now they can also automatically classify all the different articles, of course, from uh, keywords, but also uh, in different categories like this. Very useful. Um, and finally, if you remember, we can detect entity uh, we can detect sentiments in uh, images you can do likewise in in text okay so what i tried here i took two different reviews a positive one and a negative one from the uh, uh, from the about the hobbit the book and um here is what i get so i get a score between minus one and plus one and this score represents how positive or how negative we are speaking here inside the sentence, but it can be at the, the paragraph level or at the entity level, and it does work. So here, the negative sentences here come from Pauline's review. She hated the book, so unfortunately, uh, of course, there are many neutral sentences because most of the time we are pretty neutral. 
And here, the positive sentences come from the New York Times review. They love the book uh, and it does show. So this feature is used by companies who are browsing uh, social networks to understand how uh, users are speaking about them. Uh, they are also analyzing the different reviews they get. Sometimes they have thousands of or more uh, of reviews. Uh, and so it's difficult to, to, to get a trend. And thanks to that, they can do live analysis. Uh, for instance, whenever they see something, a peak uh, of negativity, it can be because they have launched uh, a firmware update, I, I don't know, and, and suddenly they have a bug or they've done something bad or they have a, a bad article about them. Uh, so it's used by companies to, to track how uh, we speak about them, how uh, we speak about some product services. Uh, it's also used by one company I know in the UK. Um, they are processing all the customer emails. And what's funny is they do have machine learning experts, but they're using this API just to process customer emails and to, to treat in priority the negative emails. If you think about it, it's pretty smart because they are dealing with issues as soon as possible. And when, when an email is, is very, uh, when an email is very positive, maybe you can wait a couple of hours before answering and treat the, the, the problems before. Uh, so it's a very efficient way for the customer service to, to serve, uh, to serve their, their own customers. Okay. Um, here, this is a, an example how to uh, uh, analyze uh, the sentiments in text. Uh, it's also a tutorial that I wrote. I'll give you all the, all the links uh, at the end. If you want to try it, uh, just take these few lines and uh, there are or, or more features, of course. So we've seen what you can do on text. There's another, another thing you can do on text. You can translate it. Uh, so I've never met anyone. Uh, so tell me in the chat who has never used uh, Google Translate. So this is actually a wrapper around. This is the, 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 the core, the heart of Google Translate, the translation model uh, API. So I will not get through the features because uh, it's pretty obvious and, and you have used them. Um, it works on text, HT, uh, HTML, so you can actually translate emails. But uh, I'm gonna share you uh, one fun fact with you. Um, uh, so five years, so six years, uh, almost six years ago, I was not working at Google. I was uh, working at my own company and I was using Google Translate uh, at the time. And in September, 2016, something happened. Okay, so apparently uh, the presentation is switching. Is it better? Okay, I hope. Uh, so in 2016, Google Translate from one day to the other suddenly became very, very good. So I was mainly translating uh, Chinese and Japanese text into French or English. And, um, and uh, yeah, six years ago, it worked okay. I could get the sense uh, of the text. But suddenly it, it was very, very good. So all the best, I was very happy and forgot about it. Just kept using Google Translate. And so when I joined Google, I learned actually what happened. It's actually a, a public article. So uh, in 2016, the Google Translate team switched from a statistical model to a purely machine learning model. And this is when we got so, very, so much, uh, so, so good results. Uh, here, so it's a bit under, uh, hard to understand it, but in green, it's the improvement uh, that was brought by the machine learning models. Uh, as a human, I could tell, I could tell uh, how good that was. Uh, it, uh, suddenly you would wonder, is it a human or is it a machine translation? Here in orange, you see at the time, you see the gap between a human translation and the machine translation. So the gap is pretty small. Uh, higher in Chinese at the time and so on. But what's uh, so good also about machine learning is, is that you can improve over time. Uh, you can actually keep training, provide more examples, and then your model improves. And this is what happened. Uh, I'm gonna show it to you. Um, I'm, I want to show you something else here. Um, so here, this is the representation of the different translation models. 
Uh, so it's a research paper. And what happens is that it matches the empirical study. So you know, histor historians uh, have been studying, okay, uh, French must come from uh, the Roman language and is close to Italian, to Portuguese, to Spanish and so on. And this is actually uh, matched or, or the other way around the machine learning models. They have the same uh, representation closeness. So here I can tell you, you, you can see French is close to maybe Portuguese, but also there is an in intersection with Germanic languages. And, and that is very, very true. I don't know well, uh, m uh, many of you are from India. I don't know well the, the Indic uh, languages, but here the Indi, the Bengali, I think all the uh, uh, from Northern and Southern uh, India languages here are actually uh, mapped as clusters uh, from the translation models. Uh, so there, there's an, an article uh, about it. And here you see the improvement over time. So remember, if you keep training your models, with new examples, different examples, counter examples, the models evolve. Here in green, that's the improvement uh, uh, we've been seeing over the, the past years. And also it works on languages that don't have many examples, that there are different new techniques now. So for instance, Maori, there's not a lot of Maori uh, literature uh, from uh, New in New Zealand, right? Uh, so typically uh, Maori is one of the languages here now you can get acceptable translations, but you don't have many examples to, to learn from that. Here uh, for the, the main Western languages, but also the Asian languages and so on, it just keeps improving. At, at some point you are unable to, to tell whether it's a human or a machine translation. Okay, here um, you just need two lines. You create a client and you call translate and that's it. Okay, now, um, Machine learning models about speech, both ways, from speech to text and text to speech. So what's, what you can uh, remember is that uh, it works in real time and it's now the core of assistance. If you have uh, Alexa, Siri, uh, the Google Assistant, you can speak to them, right? And how does it work? Your speech is actually transcribed into text and the text is analyzed with a, 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 a natural language model, right? This is how it works. We can understand your speech because your speech is transcribed into text and the text is analyzed. Uh, there are very nice features and so on, but I, I've, I'm a bit long, uh, I'll, I'll try to, to catch up. Maybe one feature you can remember also, uh, if you have uh, speech archives, um, some companies have hundreds of hours of speech they would like to use them, but they cannot because it's very time consuming to listen to speech and transcribe it. They, they can actually do that automatically. Uh, and they can also have the position in the, the audio file of each word. You can ask for timestamps, okay? Here's a, a code example in Python. Um, you create a client, you call recognize with some configuration. So here, for instance, I'm asking to get the punctuation I worked with dedicated um, speech to text engines in the past. I never had the punctuation. It's a very hard problem to try to understand when is the beginning and the end of a sentence and even more than that. And you can also get the, the word timestamps like this. So if you try this to code lab, uh, I recording myself um, pronouncing uh, French poetry from La Fontaine, Maître Corbeau sur un arbre perché tenait en son bec un fromage. And it does work. Uh, uh, I do get a perfect transcription of what I said over the phone, okay? Now the other way around, text to speech. You have text and you get speech from the text. Uh, I did use that in 20, oh, 22 years ago uh, in the first ebook reader I made. I was very proud. There was a speech, uh, a TTS text to speech engine embedded. You could press play uh, in a book and you could hear the book aloud. Nobody used that because it was a robot talking to you. It was Alice in Wonderland. It was very, very annoying. Now you can have human-like voices. So uh, one of them uh, at, at Google uh, is called uh, WaveNet. So it's a technology that's been developed by DeepMind. And once again, with machine learning. Um, pretty sure you, maybe in, in your train stations, you can hear sometimes the voice is pre-recording and you can hear how the, the different uh, 
parts of the sentence are stitched together, right? It uh, doesn't sound natural, uh, even though it's pre-recorded, it uh, it's a real human voice. Here it's fully synthetic. Of course, it's been trained from a real human voice, but it doesn't work at the phoneme level or whatever. It just tries to reproduce the human voice. And, and I have to admit, this is the most advanced machine learning model I've seen. Maybe because it's a very, very narrow problem. You focus on an audio signal, but it's been solved by DeepMind. So maybe you know them because they have beaten uh, the world champion for the Go game. Uh, a couple of years ago, they have beaten gamers at StarCraft. They, they know how to learn from scratch, how to solve a problem. There are research papers. Maybe let me show you um, uh, this uh, uh, demo live, okay. Uh, okay, let me try this. Oops. Okay. Okay, so I'm I'm going to uh, on Google search. Um, okay, let's go. It works in different languages, but. Uh, let's go to the English one. Uh, all of us speak English. Okay, what is that? Uh, okay, so maybe you didn't notice, but you can actually do a, a vocal search. So I'm going to, to ask something uh, to Google, uh, but with a thick French, my thick French accent, okay? And we will see uh, normally in real time how the transcription works. And this is using the speech to text uh, machine learning model. Okay. What is the temperature in Paris? So I don't know if you could see, I hope uh, in real time, I got the answers. Uh, the, the question is perfect. Um, uh, the transcription is perfect and it works despite my accent. If you try it the other way around, so for instance, uh, I'm a British man, a man uh, speaking French with my British accent, it works too. Uh, and you can try that online, there are demos. And here's the code to, to, uh, to actually also to get the answer. Uh, here's the code to generate uh, the, the, the answer. You, you didn't hear it, but I got a very pleasant woman telling me, okay, the temperature in Paris is that and, and that. Here is an example how to generate that. You actually just have to select the voice you wanna use and that's it. And then uh, you can, you specify uh, the text and, and you have an, an audio file, just these lines. It's another tutorial that I wrote. Uh, you, you, you can try that. Okay, so we've seen different examples of what you can do with existing machine learning models and they let you uh, make your uh, application smart. But in some cases, it will not work because maybe you have a, a more specific problem and the generic answers will not work. Let me give you this example. So if I take these two pictures and I input them to the vision model we saw uh, earlier, I am getting almost the same answers because basically in a generic way, those are skies uh, those are clouds in the sky, right? I get sky, cloud, it's almost the same answer. But if I want to, for instance, build a weather forecasting application, I need to be able to detect the difference between the Cyrus here and the Alto Cumulus here. And then I will work with people from the countryside to build heuristics and understand when I have this type of cloud, then the weather will be like this and so on. So here I'm stuck because I, I have very generic answers. And AutoML is, can, uh, can be a solution here. So how does it work? Here you need to work a little bit more than before. You need to provide data. So here you need to build your own custom data set from pictures or, or, the, or more. It, de it depends on, on, on your data, of course. Um, you build a data set and everything else is automated. Once you have your data set, it's an iterative pro process. So you build a data set, you launch a first training, a quick training to get a sense whether you're do doing well with your data set. Most of, the most of the time I did a couple of trainings. 
you realize we are humans, we do mistakes, you realize you have mistakes in your data set, you do a second training and suddenly it starts to work pretty well. When you do the training, you have two options. Either you want the best accuracy, uh, you want the best accuracy and then you want a cloud model. So this is the first option. You launch a cloud training, you will have a model in the cloud and you will be able to call it with your own API, okay? Everything is private. The data set is private. The API is private. This is yours. You can also build an edge model. An edge model is a lighter model that you'll be able to export to somewhere else. So for instance, uh, in a container, you can export the model and use it on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, you can export it and use it on your mobile uh, if you wanna do mobile applications for iOS or Android. And you can also uh, use the model in a web page. I'll show you an example, okay? So here, this is the data set for our weather forecasting solution. We need a pictures of clouds and we need to label them. We don't need thousands or millions of examples. Here, a few hundreds are enough, okay? It starts to work well with about 100, 200 pictures for each label. So here I label, so it's actually a data set that was done by, by my colleagues. Uh, I launched, so I used the data set. I launched a first training here, a quick one. Uh, I got the answer after uh, less than one hour. And you see the, the precision is pretty good, 84%, but should be above uh, 90%. Um, so if I want a, a good solution. So actually what I could notice here after this first training that there were some mistakes in the data set, some uh, wrong labels. So I fixed them. I also launched a longer training of three compute hours. And here you see that the precision the accuracy of my model is now 90%. There's a tool for everything visual uh, or, or whenever you have different classes um, like labels, uh, it's called the confusion matrix. And here I can see that my model is doing very well for most uh, of the different cloud types, except the Alto Cumulus here, 50% of the time, it's either not, not detected or detected as something else. What does it mean? It means that my data set is not that good for the alto cumulus. So first of all, maybe I don't have enough examples, but actually here, the issue is that my examples, they are very similar. They all look like the same. Some of them have been extracted from a video. That's not very relevant for a data set because uh, when you wanna build a, ba a balanced data set, you want a very diverse set of examples that are pretty significant and, and different, okay? So maybe building a data set. So this is most of the work you need to do here. Building a data set will be a job uh, by, by itself, maybe in the next year, uh, or like an art, right? If you wanna write good code, you also need to, to be able to, to build a, a good data set, okay? Uh, so I have my cloud uh, model now, I can, um, I can actually uh, get it served automatically. And then I have an API and here I can upload uh, pictures and use it in real time. Here, this is a picture coming from my smartphone. It's not been used in the data set, never seen uh, by my model. And the result I get is that it's a cumulus at 97% of accuracy. Really great, it works, it does work, okay? Remember my definition, different type of data. So how does it work? How, in which cases can you do AutoML? You can do AutoML, uh, you can build AutoML models from text, images, videos, but also from stru structured data like uh, tables, so databases, even Excel files, CSVs, when you have rows and columns. And from that, you can build many different custom machine learning models. You can even do your own custom translation model if you're not happy with the translation API, you can do your own custom shot detection or custom classification of videos and so on and so on. Okay, here, um, the automail features are also grouped uh, at Google, for Google Cloud anyway, under ve the Vertex AI. So this is the whole AI platform. Maybe here, this is a, a more simple view 
to understand what you can do. Custom video object tracking. Uh, here, this is something uh, you can detect your own video actions uh, in a video, uh, video actions, of course, in a video. Uh, so you can detect video actions, um, specific ones. It's used by all the sport uh, uh, TV channels. Something also very specific, you can do image segmentation. So I didn't show an example, but you can say in a picture, okay, this pixel belongs to the background or this pixel belongs to this uh, object. So you can do very precise uh, uh, object detection at the pixel level, okay? So now it's demo time. Um, you can um, either use your laptop uh, webcam or your smartphone. I've built this demo and in this demo, I wanna try to detect emotions uh, from selfies. So we're gonna use the vision model and try to detect generic emotions. But at the same time, I'd like to know whether you're having fun, whether you've been a bit uh, uh, sleeping uh, or just for fun. Let, let's try to detect emotions that no machine learning, machine learning model uh, detects because it's fun, but not very useful. So I did build uh, this, data, uh, this machine learning model to detect people with the tongue out, people yawning or people sleeping, okay? And uh, so this is the architecture of my demo. Uh, from your smartphones, you're gonna be able to send me selfies. Um, so it will be uploaded to this uh, bucket. So it's a cloud storage. Uh, whenever there's a new file here, it will call a, a function a Python function. And the function will first analyze the video to know whether there are faces in the video, uh, sorry, in the selfie, in the picture. Uh, if, if you take a picture of your foot, then it will not work. But if it's a selfie, if there's a face, then you will get a result. Uh, just one thing, um, we may see you at the end, I will show the results. So we may see you in the recorded video on my screen. So if you don't want, potentially to appear, don't do the demo, but otherwise uh, it should be fun, uh, hopefully. Okay, so demo time. Um, so let me um, enable the, the video and I'm gonna give you this link. Okay, so, okay, uh, sorry. Let me first give you in the chat, it, will, it should be faster. Oops. Not what I wanted to do. Uh, I should have the links around here. So I'm gonna give you the link. Maybe it will be, uh, of course I lost it. So, so sorry. So uh, either you use the QR code here. I hope you see it. Or let me uh, copy paste this in the chat. to everyone. Okay. Does it work? Okay, let me type HTTPS in front. Okay, so if you open the demo, I hope it's okay for you. Yeah, you normally yeah, normally it should uh, open your webcam. So here, this is the webcam on, on uh, from my laptop. And uh, in the first part of the demo, you can try to trigger generic emotions. So there are four of them here. Uh, try to be joyful, surprised, sad, or angry. Uh, surprise and, and, and joy are the most easy, the easiest uh, sentiment to detect. So let, let's try that first. Hey. So the selfie is uploaded, uh, face detection is done. I know where the nose and the mouth are. And so I can add, add the mustache to everyone. And as you can see here, a joy is detected. So let's try to do now surprise. So you see, it's very fast. Uh, uh, surprise is detected and so on. So it should, it should work. Let's try another one, um, more difficult, uh, uh, angry. So I don't know if I look angry. Yeah, I look angry a little bit, you see. 
So it does work. I hope it works for you too. We'll see that in a bit. Uh, now let's switch to my auto ML model. And if you refresh the page or go next, you can do the same, but this time with my own private custom model. So try to stick out your tongue to your own to sleep. I, I'll try to sleep first. So it works, I'm sleeping. If you wanna try, help me improve my model, you can uh, check this. Okay, I have a bug on my side, but uh, let's try the other emotions. Uh, so sleeping, I think the model detects the closed eyes. Here it detects the, the, the hand, but if you try with the mouse open, also it works. And finally, let's try the tongue out. Okay. And it's, it does work uh, again. So you see, um, if you are in auto ML mode, you will get a mustache with the, the colors of the Indian flag. Most of you are in India right now. Uh, and also there's a, this little animation. Um, I will give you a link to this demo at the end. Uh, it's on my GitHub, but here, this is the code. This is the code to do the, 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 the image uh, analysis. I'm asking here for face detection, for object detection and safe search detection. If there was a zombie in the audience, it would be detected as a violent selfie, right? Maybe with blood. And then the picture would be blurred out, okay? And you see, this is all I need. Uh, I call annotate image. I have the result and then I can add the mustache to everyone. Uh, so this is on my GitHub, if you're interested to reproduce this demo. Um, so how does it work under the hood? Um, so I'll just uh, open the hood a, a little bit. So first of all, the first technique, uh, this one is uh, specific to, at Google at least, there is a research paper. It's called Neural Architecture Search. Um, internally, we call that meta-learning. So before doing the training with your data, actually the, the, process, the auto ML is actually exploring different architectures to make sure that we, uh, the, the best architecture is selected. So um, how does it work? First, it tries to, to select uh, uh, models that will uh, train faster than others and with a better accuracy. So it, it's very, very compute in intense. Uh, and this is why also we have built dedicated hardware uh, called TPUs, tensor processing units. Is, uh, GPUs or TPUs are typically uh, used for, for trainings and for predictions. The other technique that is known to all experts is called transfer learning. This is how it works. Here on, on the left, okay, let me see the messages, sorry. Okay, uh, so here, on, uh, on the left, you have um, uh, the existing machine learning model. So for instance, the vision, uh, the vision model. Uh, when you provide new examples, like the, the different types of clouds, um, and you launch a training, it's building actually new layers. They are called hidden layers. And so it builds a new uh, private model for you. And this one, these layers are, is the part where your model is actually getting specialized, getting customized to solve your uh, own need, okay? Uh, and finally, the last part uh, known to experts is how to fine tune the, the hyperparameters. Uh, this is not something that can be learned from the examples. Uh, this is something that can be learned from the training itself. And so in the past, for the last 10 years, uh, experts used to fine tune these parameters. Now there are algorithms that can do better than humans. Um, and at Google, it's called Vizier. The Vizier is also an API. Um, and, and internally, the, the, the algorithm is called Hypertune. Uh, and here, so typically what it does is, in the past, in the last 10 years, experts will, would find uh, Optima here. So this is a, a good solution, uh, good parameters for the training, but actually a, a better one is here. And this is typically what Hypertune would find here, okay? So here, let me show you uh, this example. 
I have built a couple of uh, AutoML models. So remember, I'm not an expert, but I have data, right? So what I did, uh, I took uh, pictures of uh, secret balls here. I built a data set with just 100 secret balls. On the secret balls, uh, there are, uh, I have banding boxes for all the different components that I want to detect. Here, this is my desk at home. I've been working during COVID time. Here, this is a nice webcam that is able to do a quick autofocus. And here, this is typically an electronic board from one of the ebook devices I've built. So I didn't use this picture to train the model, just different pictures. And what amazed me is that I could build an edge model. You remember, it's a lighter model that you can export. And I can use it in a web page with a TensorFlow.js. So with JavaScript code, I can get my uh, model to run in a web page. So let me show you this small video. So it's pre-recorded. So here the camera is doing the autofocus. And you can see in real time, I can do a prediction while recording my video. I can do four to five predictions per second with pretty uh, good accuracy. So here I'm uh, hovering my hand to trigger the autofocus. And here, uh, finally, I get uh, almost all the components detected with a quick model here. Uh, this one is not detected, but I know why. It's because the component is kind of hidden here. And this one is missing. And I know why it's because I have a bad lighting. So whenever you're doing AutoML also, remember you will need to control your environment. If you're in a factory, you will need to be in a reproducible uh, environment. You, you, you need maybe good lightning here. The, the issue here is that there's, there are shadows and I didn't train uh, my model to, to detect components with shadows. So the lightning is pretty bad here. Okay, but it's, it already works amazingly well. It's, all, it's able to detect uh, all the other uh, circuits, integrities, ICs, the, the C, it's, sorry, it's not CPUs, but it's uh, integrated circuits uh, with pins uh, on the sides. And it works in real time offline in a web page. Uh, the second example, let me go to the next slide is uh, Document AI. So Document AI is a dedicated uh, platform for documents. You remember we can detect uh, text uh, and handwriting, but actually you can do more than that. You can detect structure. So here I did try, I asked my wife and kids to write the same sentence in a form with a question and with an answer. And here you can see that everything is detected and there is no mistake. Uh, and uh, and actually, yeah, my son, my son's handwriting is not that good. Maybe you cannot decipher this. The, 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 the OCR, the, the, the handwriting uh, OCR model is able to transcribe everything here. And more than that, it's able to, to tell me that it's a form, that here there's a key and here there's a value. And I get the same key value for all the four handwritings. Some companies are using this right now to automatically uh, process millions of documents every year. Uh, and it's just the beginning. You can process invoices, receipts, bank statements, uh, ID cards, uh, a lot. Of, so you remember if you are able to, to detect text and handwriting, then you can go to the next level. And this is what uh, Document AI is doing. So we've gone through many examples of existing machine learning models of building your own custom machine learning models of course, you can develop expertise if you have time and you can do more machine learning, more, more machine learning. Uh, so at Google, there are different platforms. I, I mentioned uh, Vertex AI, Document AI, Dialogflow if you wanna build uh, chatbots. So uh, the, the Google Home for instance, so, or Siri or Alexa are, are like chatbots, right? You can speak to them, they understand what your intent, the, the meaning of your question, and then they can answer you back and, and propose options or, or directly give you an answer, the final answer you're expecting. Uh, call centers are using AI now, oh, okay? So you can use existing products or you can build your own products. And if you wanna do machine learning uh, as of today, uh, you cannot be wrong if you choose TensorFlow and or PyTorch. Those are the two machine learning frameworks uh, that 
consoli consolidated over the, the last years. The background of the slide is actually from three years ago. Yeah, four years ago now. Uh, it was to show how, how well TensorFlow was doing uh, and Py PyTorch at the same time was doing well. And so now if we, you wanna do machine learning, choose either of those, some experts uh, use both TensorFlow and or PyTorch, okay? It's a whole ecosystem. You could spend one week at the conference to just to see how experts are building machine learning models with their own ends and those tools, okay? So it's time to wrap up. What have we seen? How can we build smarter solutions, okay? Uh, so what's the time you need with machine learning APIs? Uh, you need just hours. Uh, the, demo, the demo that I did um, with the face detection and the mustache, I did it, the, the first prototype, I did it in one afternoon. Uh, you, you really need two hours to start. Uh, you, have, you have data, you, uh, you make a, a request to the, the, the machine learning model, you have the, the answer and you try to build a, a prototype. It's really a matter of hours. For AutoML, it's rather a matter of days. I would say two days. Um, two days is what, what was needed for me to build the, the, the tongue out, uh, people yawning, people sleeping, machine learning models. Actually, it was not two days straight. It was four half days. I built the first one in half a day. It was okay. I improved it uh, the next week in half a day. And after two days, this is actually the, 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 the model that you tried in the demo uh, with a, a few hundreds of uh, samples. Of course, if you want to develop expertise, then you'll need weeks, months, or years. Uh, if I was younger, I would spend 100% of my time and maybe spend 20 or 30 years uh, doing uh, machine learning uh, and developing neural networks. The difficulty, uh, what's the difficulty for APIs? Absolutely zero difficulty. You, you've seen the code, uh, a few lines are in, enough. For AutoML, the difficulty is the data set. You really need to, to build a good data set. You need examples first real life examples. Sometimes you can build uh, synthetic ex examples, but the examples that you provide uh, the, 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 tr the training with need to be faithful to the final examples that you the model will see at prediction time, right? So, so this is the difficulty. If your data set is bad, then the model will be most likely uh, bad as well. Okay, you, you cannot do miracles. But if you have a good data set, then you will have a miracle. It means you will have a very, very good uh, state-of-the-art uh, custom machine learning model, okay? And of course, the difficulty, uh, if you want to develop expertise, you need to handle everything, right? Uh, the neural network, the data set, maybe you need, but then you have platforms and tools uh, to help you with, okay? Here are a few pointers. I will give you everything in one document at the end. Uh, so those are the different uh, machine learning APIs I showed, uh, the AutoML at Google at least, but there are other companies using AutoML, doing AutoML with the AutoML term or, or other terms. Uh, and of course, uh, TensorFlow and Vertex AI for experts. So here are a couple of, uh, here are the few code labs I've written. I, uh, those are, are the ones with the code samples I showed uh, most of the time. And also on my GitHub, you'll find uh, and on Medium, you'll find a few articles. So for instance, how to build automatically a summary of a video, how to automatically extract uh, animations from videos with the main object. So here an animal in two, 12 frames, it's act actually a, a, a monkey jumping from a branch, how to detect faces. So this is the demo that we, oh, sorry, I forgot. Uh, I forgot one thing. Uh, I told you that we would check the results. I was a bit stressed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, many of you, you didn't tell me in the chat. So you can see all the happy people from the demo. Cool, surprise people, yeah, a few of us. Uh, someone was sad, I was angry. And now AutoML, people with the tongue out. Ah, I forgot the, the fun part of the demo, sorry about it. You can see everyone has the tongue out here. Uh, only one person has maybe the tongue inside the mouth here, but I would say uh, it's pretty good. Uh, the tongue, uh, we can see the tongue, most of the tongue. So here, 
uh, the results are very good. Um, people yawning, yeah, with or without the hand in front of the mouse, everything is perfect. People sleeping, everyone is sleeping. So here, I'm pretty happy we see true positives. All the results are perfect. So I cannot tell you whether we have false negatives. Only you can tell. Whenever you got an answer and you didn't get the expected answer, it's a negative and it's a false negative because, uh, because of course, uh, it's a mistake. OK? Uh, here uh, on the screen, we could see the true positive, so the right answers, and maybe false positives. But here, everything is perfect. This one, I wouldn't consider a false positive. We, just, we do see a tongue. And if I, if I was not happy with this result, then I would use this example to as a counter example to say to my model, this example is not someone with the tongue out. And then the training will figure out by, the, by itself that when the tongue looks like it's inside the mouse and not really outside, then it should have, shouldn't give these results. OK, and finally, you remember, you remember, we can track objects. And so here we have people with glasses. Welcome to Stash Club. So you have glasses and now you have a mustache. Um, so yeah, so sorry about it. I forgot to show you the results. Uh, and on my GitHub and on, on this article, face detection and processing in 300 lines of code. So very few lines. You can actually take selfies or uh, drag and drop pictures, and then you will see how mustaches are added everywhere. Okay, and uh, and there's more, and there's new. There there's a new article coming. Um, here, this is a, a comic book from Google AI. If you want to refresh your memories or just want to learn about the terminology uh, of machine learning and deep learning, uh, and there's a lot more than than what I covered. I read it. Uh, every, once every every year to refresh my memories. Um, and thank you. Uh, uh, I'm going to give you, so you can flash the QR code, but I'm also going to give you the link to the presentation in the chat. Okay. And, uh, okay, HTTPS. HTTP, it's better if I spell it right. Okay, uh, no, not this one, sorry. Okay, sorry, I got confused in the chat. So this is the link to everything. Uh, you can also flash the QR code. A big thank you uh, to uh, everyone for having me today. I hope you learned something. I also, this is my grail. I hope uh, that uh, it gave you some ideas. Uh, sometimes at conferences, I meet uh, developers and then later on they, they tell me, oh, wow, I thought about this idea. And, and one of them actually uh, uh, created a startup in Germany. So I was uh, very happy about it. And now this is a uh, question time. If you have questions, I'm sorry if I missed questions. Uh, uh, during the talk, I'm trying to browse a little bit, but please, uh, please put your questions or maybe there's another. Yes, we do have uh, the yeah. Q&A section. We do have yeah, the Q&A section. Uh, thank you. I was only watching uh, the chat. So in the Q&A, um, I have one question in between, please. Is API re returning JSON with the content classification? So the first question. So yes, there are two ways you can use APIs, either uh, with the REST API. Uh, oh, sorry, OK. Uh, so this one, OK. So either with a REST API, uh, and if you use a REST API, you have a JSON answer. But if you're, you need very, very fast answers, if you have lots of documents, if you want to do real time, uh, if you have larger amounts of data, then you can also fast. You can go faster with a, an RPC um, a call. Uh, actually, at Google, everything is gRPC uh, based, and then the REST API is just a, a, a layer above it. So, to answer your question, yes, for all the APIs, you can either get a JSON response 
or you can get a proto buff response if you want to go faster. But if you're using the client libraries, so in whichever language you prefer, uh, I showed Python, but there's, there's Java, there's Go, there, there are different uh, language supported, then you can actually di directly uh, get the, the answers with the, the objects and you can just deal with objects. So that's typically uh, the example. So if I go back here, if you see um, here, this is a client library in Python. Uh, internally uh, here, it's getting a gRPC answer, but everything is automatically transcribed into object, Python objects. And so I can just deal, uh, do everything in Python, okay? And it's very efficient. Uh, the next question, um, okay, is the same. Uh, CAPTCHA text detection. So I'm not sure about the question, uh, does it support CAPTCHA text detection? Um, so if you, if you mean the, the text that is uh, transformed, that is uh, barely readable, so it's always the same answer. If a human cannot read a text, and sometimes you cannot read text on the CAPTCHA, so this is why you have a, please provide a, another uh, uh, picture, please provide another example. Sometimes you cannot actually read it. The machine learning model will not be able to read it, right? Uh, so keep in mind this principle. If a human being can do something as of today, uh, a simple operation like okay, read uh, printed text, uh, reading uh, handwriting text, we can do it. Then it means normally that we can build machine learning models to do the same. But if a human being is not able to do something, then as of today, uh, a machine learning model is not able to do it. For instance, with, uh, with a natural, the natural language API, uh, sarcasm, I didn't give this example. So, you know, text with a double meaning uh, is very hard for human beings to understand sarcasm, a high irony, right? Uh, some, especially if it's written in, in a chat, you have to add emojis to give some context. And so likewise, a uh, machine learning model will not understand irony, but the more context you have and the better a machine learning model will do. So, okay. So I hope it answers your question. So CAPTCHA, if you can read the CAPTCHA yourself, then the machine, the vision model will uh, be able to. If you cannot, then it, it, it won't. Uh, can you please show us a demo how to use AutoML? So I hope I, I did. Um, so can you please elaborate on the use cases of AutoML? So if I go back here, oops. So here, I hope it's the most uh, articulate maybe slide for AutoML. Uh, as of today, you can um, automatically classify pictures of yours uh, that another machine learning model is not able to. Okay, uh, if you put labels, so that's the example I gave with the different types of clouds. You can do the same whenever the different uh, objects or um, could have different labels, right? So it's called multi-label uh, classification. So image classification, but you, you can be more precise. You can do uh, custom image object detection. So bounding boxes around objects. So I, I think I told you precisely, you can also say uh, which pixel belongs to which object or just does it just belong to the background. Uh, for videos, you can classify automatically videos with your own custom classification. You can detect uh, video actions. So I told you it's used by TV channels, especially in the sport industry. You can do custom video object tracking. Uh, if ever you, you'd like to track some some specific objects. So, so you see the difference here. You can uh, detect objects in a picture. Here you can detect objects in a video, but you can also track them. So, so that's very, very useful. Um, in text, you can do text classification, like in pictures, 
or you can do multi-label text classification. If, for instance, the, the NL API is not able to uh, classify your own documents because you want to be more precise, you want to have your own classifications, then you, AutoML can be useful. You can detect your own entities if the knowledge graph is not enough because, I don't know, your enterprise is working uh, with drug names, with product names, and you would like to be able to detect them automatically, then you can do custom text entity extraction. It means you're able to detect your own entities, maybe that are not world famous or not on Wikipedia, not on public web pages, okay? You can do custom text sentiment analysis. Typically, if, you, if, if you're a company, you're uh, analyzing text that's uh, available to know how, how well, uh, if we're speaking about you positively or negatively, but if you have some terminology, product names, or that are only uh, internal, that are private to your company, uh, then you can build your own custom model to have it to work with your private documents internally, okay? And likewise, so this is not deep learning, this is pure machine learning, building uh, regression models, now it's done by uh, AutoML solutions in a so much better way. So it's called AutoML tables. If you have rows, if you have columns, you just say, okay, these columns are my input. This column is my result, my output. And then you just launch the training. Of course, you can be a bit more precise, but it's very magical. I've done that with experts. I just launched an auto email table uh, training in the background and the results that I got at the end were better than what the 50 uh, engineers were doing in a workshop. Uh, so this is really magical with auto ML, you can build your own models uh, in a very easy way and the results are, are very, very good. Uh, let me see if there are more questions. Um, okay, so... Uh, Okay, please suggest some OCR APIs. So the, the, if, you, if you do a search, uh, there are many. Uh, so at Google, it's, it's uh, within the Vision API. I think there's another one called Texteract. Um, there are dedicate, dedicated companies that who have been doing that for uh, decades and eventually they switch to a machine learning model because they get uh, better results. Um, the next question is, are those APIs available for free? So yes and no. So yes, because um, most of the time you have a free tier. So the free tier means that you can use these APIs under a certain level. So uh, uh, I will let you check, but I think for instance, if you wanna analyze pictures, you can analyze, I think it's 2000 pictures for free every month, something like that. Uh, if you want to build a custom video model uh, or object detection model, I think the first 40 hours of training are free, something like that, okay? Um, but uh, if you want to try something like that also, there is um, a platform called Colab. And on Colab, you can do a training for free, even including with GPUs or TPUs. Um, and I think the training can last two hours, something like that, okay? So there are many ways um, uh, to, to, to try this uh, for free. Uh, and, and of course, if you just wanna have a sense, um, in the link that I gave you, there are links to the online demos. So sometimes you just do a drag and drop uh, on the web page, and you have the answer right away. The document is not stored, never stored, of course. Uh, it's processed live, you have the results. And so you, you can do a test for free uh, to, to, to see the results uh, that you would get. Um, I'll share your email ID, please. So uh, please get in touch with me either on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm, I'm not sharing my, my email because I get too much spam, but uh, please feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, and also there's a feedback form. Uh, yeah, there are many ways to, 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 to reach me out. Um, next question. Um, my question is with regards to making use of these APIs, can they be accessed for free or do they require a subscription plan? Okay, so I answered the part already for free, but uh, 
at least uh, from what I know, um, it's not subscription based. It's uh, consumption based. So you don't need to subscribe to any plan. Um, whenever you use the, uh, the API and whenever you reach the free tier threshold. So for instance, you have analyzed 2000 pictures this month. Now you want to analyze 2000 more then uh, these 2000 more, I don't know, they, they will cost. Uh, so usually there's a, uh, a cost. I, I don't know the pricing actually uh, per, uh, I don't know, thousands of uh, documents. So for one document, it's very, very small. Uh, it's with several digits after uh, zero. Um, so yeah, it's by bunches. So do they require a subscription plan? No, um, I, I don't know about uh, other companies, but it's really like the serverless world, right? Uh, if you're working in the cloud, you don't pay any, any plan, you pay only for consumption and that's very effective for everyone. Uh, and, and, and I do love this model. Um, I'd like this answered with respect to both development and production phases. Uh, there are actually uh, no differences. Um, uh, if you're developing or having your solution um, live in production, there is a, a, no difference. If you are a startup, uh, if you mean, uh, can we get discounts? Uh, so you should get uh, in touch with uh, sales people. But I think if you're using a lot of uh, machine learning models, then of course, yeah, you can get discounts, I think. Um, uh, but also if you are a startup and, and you wanna start, I think there are programs for startups when you can get credits. Um, yeah, sorry, that's my answer. Uh, I don't know if there are other ones. Uh, next question. Good evening, sir. Can you let us know how one should start learning machine learning if he or she does not have any background in ML? While tools and skills are needed to get started. So the first skill is passion. If you're passionate about machine learning, uh, then go for it. Go for it. Um, the tools, yeah, if you have a laptop, it's the best tool to start. Uh, I mentioned the platform CoLab. Uh, so, sorry, I, I will uh, try to search it because I don't want to, to give you the wrong link, but CoLab is also a platform. Uh, it's actually, uh, oh, sorry, uh, CoLab, this one. Okay, I'm gonna put it uh, in, the, in the chat. So Colab is like uh, a Google Drive for uh, machine learning uh, experts. So in Colab, you will find uh, very often Python notebooks. You can copy paste them, right? Uh, you can make a copy of a notebook. It's your own notebook and you can do the actual training and reproduce everything uh, others have done. Uh, and then you can show, change the, the notebook for your own use and you can do actual trainings. Um, and I told you regarding the frameworks, I, uh, I honestly uh, strongly recommend TensorFlow and PyTorch uh, because they are the, the mainstream platforms. Uh, have a look uh, if you're already, and if you are an, an engineer and you've done a lot of machine learning, uh, some of them are using PyTorch. If you are a beginner, I would recommend uh, you to use uh, TensorFlow uh, both platforms have, they are converging, they are providing the same features, they have some different approaches, but they are converging honestly. So, so yeah, TensorFlow and or PyTorch. Uh, well, the next question is, where did you deploy the model? So you can actually, when you build the model, you can decide where, in which region of the world you wanna do it. So I'm based in Europe. So I prefer to have my data, my data set and my predictions made in Europe. But here it doesn't make sense because uh, you are from all over the world. Um, so, so yeah, if uh, you can actually deploy in different regions. So, so yeah, it, it, then it depends on your use case. So yeah, so my models, I deploy them most of the time in Europe. Sometimes in the US, I've not tried in other parts but you can deploy up, depends on when you are. Yeah, there's no end to the world. I, I was gonna say you can deploy up to Australia, but this is just because this is uh, uh, to the other world of 
to the other part of my world. Uh, are these APIs chargeable? Uh, I'm not sure to understand. I hope I answered with the different uh, uh, free and, and billable uh, tiers. Uh, how can we make a self-evolving train model with every new test data? Yes, yeah, so that's a very good question. So companies who are doing machine learning all the time, they are actually, they can launch training uh, constantly. So they have a stable model, they have new data. So in parallel, they, they launch new trainings and they, they, they make sure that they are not diverging, that they are doing better and better. And when they are do, doing better, then it means uh, they can replace uh, the model in production with a new version. So yeah, many companies are doing training all the time. Uh, I hope it answers your question. Any uh, API suggestion for ranking the documents while searching the text? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, any, okay. What is the comp computational power required for building these models? Yeah, actually, uh, what's funny is that you don't know. <laughs> when you use AutoML, um, the, the training is deployed on, on clusters of machines with GPUs or TPUs, and you don't know. But uh, if we had to, to make dedicated hardware, TPUs, to, make, to, to be able to uh, train faster or predict faster with less uh, power, so, so it means the computation, computational power is pretty huge. I don't have figures to give you, I'm sorry. Uh, but what's cool is that with better hardware, you can actually train more or better or faster. Uh, and so it's a, a virtuous uh, circle. Different ML models uh, learn from data differently. The explainability methods give different explanations but we can find some level of similarity among the explanations. With that, can we integrate all the explanations into a model ag an agnostic explanation? Oh, I'm not expert enough to answer your question, but there is a very important um, topic behind it. It's explainability. So one of the drawbacks of machine learning today is that it works a little bit like a black box. You provide the input, you get an answer, and it works or it doesn't work. But if you want to trust the answer, especially when it's related to, to us, right? Uh, uh, if it has an impact or uh, if I ask something to my assistant and the answer is not that good, okay, it's funny. I can make fun of the assistant. But if I'm driving a car, right? If the, 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 my assistant is driving my car for me, then my life could be in danger. So, so what's very important is uh, a new topic uh, where uh, on which researchers are working since a few years is explainability, being, ex being able to explain where the answer is coming from or to what the answer is related to, uh, how does it correlate with the input. And so for instance, on the vision model, it's uh, an explainability feature you can ask to get uh, a pixel matrix to understand which were the pixels which contributed positively or negatively to the answer. And it's already a big help to better understand the answers. And sometimes you will see that, okay, I got the right answer, but for the wrong reasons. Or also it's a good way to, to know that you got the right answer for the good reasons. Let, let me give you one example. Uh, when I told you that the data set is the most important. Uh, so there was, a, uh, it's in my Twitter uh, feed. There was one example of X-rays. So radiographies of the, 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 of the lungs actually. And um, uh, the researchers wanted to predict uh, lung cancer. And so they did a training on X-rays and the results were like, okay, on this X-rays, the machine learning model is able to detect the lung cancer 99% of the time. This is crazy. Uh, most of the time you are not reaching 99%. So it's a, it's a red flag, right? Where you should check 
your data, especially for the first time, you, you get so, so, so good results. And what happened actually is that those were x-rays where the experts or the, 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 the doctors had put their pencil uh, around or nearby the, the, the cancer, uh, the cancer, tum the tumors. And so what happened is that the machine learning model learned not to detect the cancer, but to detect the pen marks on the x-rays. So you see here, in this case, it was a very bad data set. Uh, but if you get the explanation matrix, or if you check the pixels, then you see that uh, the positive feedback is coming from pencil marks. And so that's an issue. Okay, so, so that's one of the tools uh, to be able to explain, but it's a, big, um, it's a big topic and many researchers are working on that. And the next improvement will also, also come from this field. Um, hey, Lauren, sorry to interrupt. Um, since yes. we are running out of time, you may okay. you know, keep answering a few questions. I think that will be helpful in wrapping up the session. You may okay. scroll down and, uh, and you know, answer a few important ones, which you feel will be helpful for the audience. Sure. Sure, sure. Uh, so I'll try, um, I will have to leave the room too. Uh, I'll try to answer a few uh, questions um, in the Q&A. Uh, yeah, you don't have, have to leave the room. You, you don't have to leave the room. You may answer. No, but but I I, I also booked the room and and I should okay. I should have left the room uh, ten minutes ago. <laughs> so okay, you, so you I, may have. Yeah. May so. So so yeah. So um um, it's it's time for thank yous and goodbyes, right? Yep. No, no. You yeah. you may answer those questions. You may answer those yeah. questions, so which you find that will be helpful for the audience. Oh, I, I can keep going. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you can skip a few questions which uh, which aren't that important and answer the ones which you know which will be a knowledgeable okay. purpose. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Sorry. So I'm uh, I'm going on a little bit. Uh, Okay, uh, in the face detection example with AutoML, where in the code you provide the user feedback, good or bad, how is that user feedback scored by the ML model? Okay, so in my, I guess in my demo, um, I'm giving you a sense of how well the detection was. So actually I'm just using the confidence score so it's a score between zero and one or between zero and 100%. And so I gave like five stars when the score was above 85 or 90%, okay? Uh, and and uh, I only showed the result above 50%. So when, whenever something didn't work for you, it meant uh, like not sure, it meant that the, the confidence score was below 50%. And to complement that, uh, how can you uh, have a feedback loop uh, with your data set? When you do the training and you see that you have some issues, you need to improve your data set and, and maybe uh, add new examples. And this is how you improve uh, the, the, the accuracy of, of, of your model. I hope uh, it was a precise enough question. Alors, uh, so the next question. I was using OC the OCR library, but it was reading sometimes correct results and sometimes not. If you can suggest some library. Uh, so I don't know which library you, you were using. So I suggest to do a try with the online demo to see if it solves your problem. And if it does, then do use a, a, a cloud machine learning API. Uh, can we do image captioning using using machine learning API? Yes, yes, we do. And actually it's done. So on pictures, uh, if you ask for uh, entity detection or just for labels, then you have a, a, a description of the picture with labels. So you can actually uh, use the best or the labels with the highest confidence score and just add captions on the image. It does work on videos too, and in real time with the audio feed. Uh, if you're using uh, YouTube, or if you're using um, video chat solutions, 
or at least ours, I know, uh, maybe on others, you can now have live transcriptions while you're speaking. So it means, so here it's on the speech uh, and for uh, image captioning or video captioning, it's the same. You can actually display the labels, uh, but on videos, it would be on the different sequences because of course there are different ways to, to describe a video throughout uh, the sequences. Uh, so someone mentioned that they are using Tesseract. So that that's also one, uh, how to generate synthetic data sets. So I'm not aware of uh, enterprise solutions. Um, you can use platforms like Vertex AI or actually AutoML uh, solutions. They are producing what we call data augmentation. So they are produ producing synthetic examples from your data set. It's fully automated and hidden. But if you wanna develop synthetic data set by yourself, uh, it depends on your use case. Or for instance, if um, to help uh, to train um, uh, cars to drive, of course, cars are uh, recording uh, actual streets and actual travels. Uh, they are learning from actual videos, but at the same time to be able to cover many, many different use cases. Uh, there are models made from 3D um, animations, 3D videos, uh, fully synthetic. But of course, do not rely only on synthetic data because otherwise uh, when you provide real life data, then uh, you will have an issue that uh, it will not work or it will not be precise enough. Hey Lauren, um, sorry to interrupt again. I think we're running yeah. uh, out of time. So I'll request the audience to contact Lauren on his LinkedIn or Twitter to get to you know ask the questions. I think we need to end this session as soon as possible now. We are running out okay. of time. Yeah, yeah, of course. So okay, so first, so, of, yeah, first of all, apologies for my end for not being able to pronounce your name correctly. I think I'll have to work on my French, uh, French speaking skills. But uh, nevertheless, thank you for a wonderful session. I personally was glued to laptop for the past one hour. Yeah, we were forced to sleep and yawn, but again, it was a very, very insightful session. So uh, on, on behalf of Analytics with there, I would like to thank you wholeheartedly for this amazing session. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This data our session ends here, and we will be soon back with another session. Till then, keep learning. Thank you.